Right, today we are continuing on with the need assessment and we are almost at the uh, last end of this domain. Uh, we have already talked about how to do the need assessment. We are now at the stage where we are going to be recommending an action to address the business needs. We have covered some of it yesterday. Here, I will just remind you the steps. There are six steps here. First of all, include a high level approach for adding capabilities. When we talked about what are the identifying the capabilities and then how can you add the capabilities. I've shown you a diagram where when you have identified the capabilities, then we said <clears throat> prioritize which capabilities are most important to you. As if you can add only those capabilities which are of the highest of value. Second step would be to provide alternative options for satisfying the business need. What are the various ways? So which, what are the various options available to you? Out of those options, we will ultimately be suggesting one. But right now what we are talking about is coming up with a number of options to resolve the problem to fulfill the business need. Then identify all the constraints, assumptions and risks for each option. Uh, naturally, uh, what all are the limitations, which are all are the assumptions we have taken are the high level risks. For each one of those options, we must clearly know and understand and then assess the feasibility of organizational impacts of each option. These four headings we had discussed yesterday. So uh, the next step after having done all these four steps would be to recommend the most viable option. Number one, I mean, uh, out of the very various options you had uh, as alternatives, you are going to recommend one, which is the most viable. Naturally, you are going to give reasons for that and then only conduct the cost benefit analysis of that recommended option, only that recommended option. So I'll just flash the, the previous slide, which uh, we have already discussed. That was a, include the high level approach for adding capabilities. And in that, let me show you. I think there was a slide which, okay. It is not there for you. So, we were discussing yesterday, assess the feasibility and organizational impact of each of these options. So in that we said operational feasibility, technical feasibility, cost effectiveness and the time feasibility, and ultimately the assessment of all the factors. Business analyst assesses the feasibility factors of each prospective solution, right? So each one of those options would be weighed against each other as if to decide which is the best option. Naturally, we are not selecting the best option as yet, but we have to analyze, we have to do the feasibility of each one of those options. Next step is to now to recommend the most viable option. Naturally, we have done all the feasibility from all the angles of all the options. Now we must be knowing which is the most feasible option the best option, the most viable option. So after examining potential options for addressing a business need, the business analyst needs to recommend the most viable option, assuming that more than one option remains viable after feasibility analysis. So we do understand that out of the various options available to us, some of them were not feasible, but some of them would be feasible but again what i am looking at is to go for the best option or the most viable option not only the feasible option there could be three feasible options but out of the three which is the best option that is what i am looking at the business analyst should recommend the most feasible option if only one option is judged to be feasible then that option in most cases would be recommended when there are no viable options to address the need the option is to recommend that nothing nothing be done. So as I said, if there are more than more than one feasible options, then probably the best will be chosen. If there is only one feasible option, that will definitely be the recommendation. And if there is no option which has been proven to be feasible, then your recommendation would be 
that nothing, no action should be taken. When faced with two or more feasible options for solutions, the remaining choices can be ranked, ordered based on how well each one meets the business need. So we have to do some kind of, uh, uh, you know, comparison. Some kind of weighted, weighted uh, uh, weighting has to be allocated as if we can find the best out of them. For example, when an organization is re-engineering its operations as opposed to outsourcing it, these two options can be ranked according to how well each one solves the business problem and contribute to the business objective. So whichever is the most uh, contributive towards the business objective, whichever is most suitable for the business problem, only that option would be recommended. So what are the various me methods of doing that? <coughs> one is called weighted ranking. I know all of these methods which I am discussing with you, you might have already been using. You must must be knowing them um, or maybe partially knowing them or at least you might have heard about them. But these you must now understand that where these tools are, these methods or techniques are exactly to be used. So when you are having more than one, uh, more than one or two or more options, um, a practical effective method is to use a weighted ranking matrix. A weighted ranking matrix, our table, combines pair matching with weighted criteria to add objectivity to a recommendation. So you will compare two options and choose which is best in a certain capability and then whichever is the best is compared with the next one and that's how you keep finding which is the, uh, which is the best option. Pair matching is performed by taking each option and comparing it with one by one to all other options and then voting or ranking which option is the most preferred. Weighted ranking is also useful to test an initial or intuitive choice against other options. The criteria used for ranking should align with the goals and objectives identified earlier in the need assessment. The basic approach is to select weighted criteria for each item to be ranked. Each option is ranked by voting on it against every other option one at a time. Scores for each alternative are multiplied by the weights and added to arrive at the score for each option and the overall ranking. So let us see you are looking at say five different variables. Maybe you know how much uh, time it will take, uh, cost or something else, whatever. So in time, uh, time may be most important to you. So you have given it a weightage of five times, five times weightage than a single unit. Cost may have two times the weightage. Quality may have one times the weightage or whatever. Maybe, you know, I'm just naming few things, but it depends upon what variables are you using. You are not exactly going to be using scope, time and cost, but I am just naming it that maybe they are the variable. So every variable should be assigned a weightage according to your need. So include between three to nine criteria as a practical range for the number of criteria. If a problem has fewer than three criteria, then a weighted Ranking matrix is rarely needed to analyze each other. If there are only two two variables, then wh what are you comparing against? You don't need, need to compare anything. You just know which is better. If there are more than nine criteria, it will be difficult to stay, for stakeholders to judge and compare the alternatives one by one. Additionally, the problem may be overly complex and may need to be broken into subsets to properly analyze it. Next step would be to assign weights. First of all, you have selected a number of variables or criteria, and it says um, three or more three to nine criteria must be there and if there are nine criteria or more uh, more than nine criteria then it means it is going to be complex so you have to uh, come up with some other solution in which you can even make subsets of these criteria and then try to compare them accordingly but if you are within the range of three to nine, then probably this can be easily handled. Now the next step is that uh, each one of these criteria which you have selected, maybe three, four, five, six, whatever. 
So assign a specific weightage by either percentage or decimal. It is usually usually preferable if the weight adds up to 100%. Naturally, if uh, you know you are giving weightage to five items, so if they all are 20%, then total is 100%. So uh, if you vary these weightages, you say that no, this one is 10%, this is 30%, this is 20%, this is um, 25% and 25%. So that way, uh, still the total will be 100%. So weightage of uh, all the weightages assigned to all the variables should sum up to 100%. If you are talking uh, talking in terms of percentage, or if you are talking in terms of a unit, then it should all sum up to one. So you have point one weightage to first variable and point three weightage to second variable and so on and so forth. So these all weightages, if totaled up, they will be equal to one. Next step, determine how voting will be conducted. How are you going to decide what is the better options? Maybe people who are sitting here who are actually involved in this analysis are uh, in this approach. Uh, they would be voting for it. So what would be the method of voting? There are many methods of voting. One of those methods is a simple majority majority rule. Uh, so if you are going for a majority rule, there, there could be other methods also. Like, you know, you can have the plurality. Uh, if you have more than one option, then you can have plurality. Maybe you have three options. So which whichever option gets the maximum votes, no matter it is more than 50% or not, that is called plurality. But if there are only two options and the winner, uh, the more than 50% party wins, then that is called majority rule. Another alternative is to record the number of stakeholders who vote for each pairing. This method provides one vote per person instead of one vote for the winner of the pairing. Teams may prefer to provide the stakeholders who have more authority in the organization with more votes. Maybe, you know, yes, you can also assign weightage to the stakeholders that this is very important stakeholder he is equal to three stakeholders otherwise. So you can also assign weightage to their votes. For example, a sponsor might receive two votes and everyone else might receive one vote. Check to ensure that results make sense to the voters. Since unrealistic results will not be helpful, options that score excessively high or low could indicate skewed results or could indicate that one option is the clear favorite. Our stakeholders for their subjective responses to the voting outcome. If the results are not trusted by the team, it usually means that the criteria weights and the are the voting method needs to be refined. So, for example, one of the goals of the insurance company is to raise revenues. One criteria would be to compare alternatives against how well each option helps to increase the revenue. So, this could be uh, a way of doing that. Let's have a look at this chart and see how this weightage has been has been calculated for various uh, various items. For example, it says items. There are three items to be ranked. There are three criteria. Uh, first is X Y Z software package. Uh, it's increase if it increases revenue. Uh, the weightage is 0.3 or 30 percent. Decrease claims weightage is 40% or 0 0.4. Ease of implementation weightage is 20%. Cost is weightage is 1. So these are the four different criteria. No, sorry, three different criteria. Increase revenues, decrease claims, and ease of implementation. But they all should sum up to 1. So uh, what does it mean? It means uh, X by Z software package has voted 1 so it comes out to 1 into 0 0.3 is 0 0.3 0 0.4 0 0.2 0 0.2 so total votes received are 1.1 and the final ranking uh, according to that uh, if we compare all the three options there are this is second in uh, second best result So cost weight, cost has got one weight, right? Basically, there are four criteria. Basically, there are four criteria. Uh, 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, and 0 0.1. It sums up to be 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. 
so yes of course 0 0.3 plus 0 0.4 plus 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1 is equal to 1 means increase revenue is 30 percent decrease claims is 40 percent ease of implementation is 20 percent and cost is one is 10 percent okay so how many votes did you get one for increased revenue one for decreased claims one for ease of implementation and two for cost so if, uh, when they are summed up it comes out to be 1.1 for the smart develop smartphone interface in house we get 1.4 and outsource interface de de development you get 0.5 so naturally 1.4 is the clear winner and the second option is xyz software package and so on and so forth so the collaboration point here is when constructing a weighted ranking matrix the business analyst should consult with the sponsor of the of the needs assessment to determine which stakeholders to include in the voting process and naturally also how much how many votes to be allocated to each of those stakeholders naturally we said that anyone who is more important gets more votes the stakeholder who are voting should be consulted about each, which criteria are weights to use so before you set up the rule set up the criteria and weightages you must consult with the stakeholders and it should be a consensus how it should be calculated likewise decisions regarding the weighting system and the weights require collaboration with the stakeholders So this was as far as the weighted uh, weighting was concerned. Then we conduct the cost benefit analysis for recommended option. So whatever the recommended option is, say there were 10 options out of which seven are not feasible and three were feasible. Out of the three feasible, I have just chosen one and I have recommended one. Now that one option has to be thoroughly dug into and I will do the cost benefit analysis for that before recommended a preferred option a cost benefit analysis should be performed the expected project benefits and cost need to be articulated in greater detail during a cost benefit analysis than during a feasibility analysis feasibility analysis was different feasibility analysis was basically just to tell you whether it it is uh, all right to do it or should we not do it the earlier estimates performed during the feasibility analysis are now replaced by rough order of magnitude estimate of benefits and costs. So this is a bet better estimate than the feasibility analysis because feasibility analysis was too sketchy. But still, I would say even the rough order of magnitude is also not some uh, very detailed estimate. This is also rough order of magnitude estimate. This is approximation. If the business case is accepted and a project is initiated, these estimated will be used, estimates will be used during the project initiation. So as far as the purposes of the initiation, they are good estimates. But naturally, when the project will take shape, the project manager will go into the detailed estimate and that estimate would be the best estimate. Organizations often have standards that dictate when and how to perform a cost benefit analysis including which financial valuation methods to employ so this is all depends upon the policy of your organization depending on the organization consult with the financial analyst or a representative from finance to prepare the cost benefit analysis to support the business case work so you are creating a business case before the project could be initiated so uh, the major element which is um, you know the decision of the business case the final recommendation of the business case is based on this cost benefit analysis the most common valuation techniques are briefly described and the recommended recommendation will contain at least one of them so what are they okay <clears throat> okay uh, just tell me if you have heard about these things earlier cost benefit analysis what is your opinion about that uh sir a little bit but i have not done this but uh, yes my manager do this things now with weightage and you know cost benefit okay but i know terms i've listened these listen these terms okay very fine okay let me explain it to you first in a layman term 
you will understand it better. The very first thing is, uh, which is not listed here, there are only three methods listed here. Let me see, are there any more? Uh, and there, is, there are four listed here, but I'll tell you five. The first is, which is not listed here, is, is a net profit method. Net profit is, basic theory behind, behind cost and benefit analysis is, if I am investing my money in something, how much is money is going in and when it is going in and how much money I am going to receive out of it or, uh, and when it is going to come, come out of it. So basically we are talking about the cash flows. And the interesting part is still this initiative or this project has yet not started and we are doing just estimates or for that matter guesstimates. We are Excuse guessing. me sir, can I interrupt you here? I cannot see which slide you are reading. First one is pay, payback period. I no, can no. see payback period. First I have not started that slide. I am okay, just okay. explaining it on my own. Okay, okay. I am explaining the concept of cost benefit. Mm -hmm. Whenever you you go for an initiative or a project for which you want to do the feasibility, the basic thing mm -hmm. is you must understand how much investment you are going to put into this job. Right? Mm -hmm. And what is the benefit going to come out of it? How much revenues will be given back to me? If you are doing a business, what are you investing? Maybe you are investing investing 100,000 rupees. And what is the pattern of revival or retrieval of that money? Maybe you say that every month I will get 10,000 rupees. So mm -hmm. after a period, say one year, how much would, would you have invested in that period of one year and how much you would have gotten out of the business? This, uh, this is your negative and positive sum. Negative sum is what you have been investing into it. Positive sum is what you are getting out of it. Are you getting me? Yes, sir. So if you can somehow add all of these amounts, the negative amounts and the positive amounts, negative amount is your investment, positive amount is your revenue. Revenue. So if you add it all up, you will get a value. If the... Mm -hmm. Ultimate value is negative. What does that mean? It is a loss. It is a loss. Yeah, me, meaning that you have invested more than what you, you got. Mm -hmm. But if the value is positive, that means that you have got more than what you have invested. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, yes. negative simply means that this is not feasible. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. And uh, if there is, uh, if, if it is zero, then there is no fun in doing this business. I put this much money into it and I get exactly the same amount of money back. So what, uh, why did I put in so much effort to get zero? So this is also not feasible. So anything zero or less than zero is not feasible and anything positive is okay is feasible. That is as far as the feasibility goes. But the question is, is it okay if this is feasible and the pro and the benefit is only one rupee? If the benefit is only one rupee, should I go for it? Or in another case, if the benefit is a hundred thousand, the net profit is hundred thousand, should I go for it? So when I am comparing more than one feasible options, whichever option is giving me the maximum benefit would be cho chosen, right? So let us calculate and estimate what all money I need to invest in the project and what is the pattern of spending that money. 
do I have to invest only once in the lifetime of the project in the beginning or I will keep investing every month or every year or whatever periodic cycle. So all the monies I would be investing should be a negative amounts and they should be put aside. All the monies which I will be getting as revenue would be the positive amounts and should be added together. Now, if I add them both up the negative values and positive values, my answer should be positive. And uh, larger, the, larger the number, better it is. And one thing more, once I have deducted the investment out of the revenue, what do I get? I have deducted the total investment out of the total revenue. What do I get? I will get the profit, of exactly. course, if it is the big number. Exactly. So that is called net profit. And that is one way. That is the very first method, which is which is not shown here. That is the very, very first method. Why is it not shown here? Because that is uh, the basic theory and that is not a very viable method. Why it is not viable? Because this does uh, this just shows us a positive or negative figure which tells us it is feasible but uh, let me give you an example uh, to explain that i will i will just uh, bring up another slide just hold on a minute <clears throat> I'm just uh, going to uh, uh, bring up some slides on cost benefit analysis that will make the things much clearer to you. Just give me a moment as if I can get there. That would actually explain things because that is uh, supported by uh, an example also. I'm sorry, sorry for the wastage of time, but I'll just get you there.
sir we have these documents in the system i mean in this program we have these documents which documents uh this uh, these we, we are discussing uh, actually it's related to business analyst yeah you see in in this uh, in these papers there are only these small little definitions are there but what i what i am showing you going to show you is something which is mm -hmm. more detailed and i can provide you that but i am still in search of that okay. it is i i am unable to find it so you can take your time mm -hmm. Okay, can you can you see that? Yes, economic assessment, cost benefit analysis. Yeah. Okay, just to give you uh, just a little uh, introduction to this. Naturally, I've, there are so many slides there, but I am not going to cover all of them. But you, mm -hmm. can see, you can see here. We we have all the costs which we will be spending on this initiative. that is the investment and all the benefits which will be coming out of it these are the benefits so if i sum up all the costs and i sum up all the benefits then the net benefit or the net profit would be total benefits minus total cost do you get me Yes, sir. I got you. Total Means the benefit. benefit is what are the total benefit minus total cost. Exactly. This is also called 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 net net profit. Net profit is mm -hmm. total benefit minus total cost. So if the answer is negative, that means it is not feasible. Mm -hmm. If the answer is positive, only then it is feasible. Then we compare. all the various options which is the most suitable okay that much is okay but types of costs can be there for any initiative there could be three types of costs one is the development cost that is the development of the idea uh, how you came up to this solution how much you know you have spent in uh, feasibilities and all that then naturally you make a business case so then is the setup cost you have to assume this cost although you are at the stage of doing the cost benefit analysis but you will assume how much money will be spent in the installation of this system the setup cost which will include the hardware software everything installation you know setting up the whole system and then running the the running the, the system the cost of operating the system that is called operational cost so these are all the costs right from the inception of the idea till you know the operations continued so say you are taking a time period of 5 years during this 5 years you have conceived the idea you have installed it and then you have run it for a couple of years this is the total whatever money you have invested into this initiative for 5 years is your total cost what are the benefits the benefits you are getting there again of three types one are the direct benefits the, these are the benefits you, which are tangible benefits 
which you are expecting and which can be you know actually uh, translated into money so these, these these are the expected benefits the value of these expected benefits is my direct benefit then are the accessible indirect benefits there are other benefits which are a side effect of the main benefit we will get this benefit and it can also be assessed but this was not my focus but naturally this can give me added value added you know income or something like that so additional benefits i am going to get out of this initiative in in addition to the direct benefits these are called accessible indirect benefits then we have got intangible benefits these are those kinds of benefits which are uh, highly difficult to assess because they are not tangible you say that you know uh, you feel happy after meeting me how can you express the level of happiness in money do you say that you are 10 rupees happier no you can't say that so how can a intangible benefit be assessed although it cannot in financial terms it cannot but still uh, if you can somehow translate these intangible benefits also because they also carry value for example you have the repo of your organization at stake so what is the cost of repo i hope you can understand the cost of repo is so high but it is intangible so somehow allocate some value to that so these are all the benefits sum up all the benefits subtract all the costs from it and that will be your net benefit or net uh, profit Are you with me on that? Hello, yes, sir. Um, yeah. Did you get what I said? Yes, sir. I got that. Means the companies usually give benefits, um, you know, to keep um, in job interested. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. It is not okay. a matter of what company is giving you. It is what the initiative is giving you if you are doing a project what project is giving you back you are investing into the project is the project giving back giving you back something project whatever it gives you back is your benefit the investment i am making into it is my money going into the project so why i am investing into this project is because the benefit of coming out of the project should be more than I my investment. Are you with me on that? Yes, sir. I'm on that point. Okay. I'm talking about the intangible benefit. Right. Intangible benefits usually cannot be expressed. Like, like you have done a project, and uh, your people feel very energetic after doing that project. They they feel more interested in the job. They are more happier. So these are some benefits out of that specific project, but they cannot be really assessed. But naturally, these benefits will improve the productivity of the organization. And naturally, that increase in productivity could somehow be assessed. So if at all possible, try to allocate some value even to the intangible benefits. G? Yes, sir. got it. Okay, let's take take an example first. Let us suppose that these are the four projects in front of you. Project one, project two, project three, and project four. Let us also suppose that all of these projects require to be, require the investment that benefit only once in the beginning. You don't have to keep investing into these initiatives over the period of time so the negative amount is only shown at year zero when these projects start let us also assume that all of these four projects start at the same time 
and all of these four projects are to be assessed for five years and as i said the investment is only made once in the beginning project one we are invested under investing hundred thousand on project two we are investing one million project three one hundred thousand and project four hundred and twenty thousand this is the total investment but i am not saying that we are running all the four projects together you are going to tell me you are going to select the most feasible project which we should go for as i said most viable option you are going to suggest the most viable option okay uh, it is expected it is just our estimate or guesstimate we expect that project one will be giving us 10,000 at the end of year one another 10,000 at the end of year two another 10,000 at the end of year three another 20,000 at the end of year four and another 100,000 at the year, end of year five can you tell me how much money project one will give me in five years the benefit total what are the total benefits actually uh, it is uh, we uh, consider the total benefit and then the total cost minus total cost and that forget, will be the forget about the benefit. forget about the cost just tell me how much money are you getting in five years from this project 50000 no 20 i am saying forget about the investment we'll talk okay. about it later how much money you are getting out of, out of this project in five years getting out of right yeah what are the total total revenues total revenues is 120 150 150 I think. so yeah. now you you subtract this one uh, um, total benefit you subtract the investment from it so 150 minus 100000 comes out to be 50000 which is my net profit this is my yeah. net profit so if you look at these mm -hmm. other other three projects the net profit for project 2 comes out to be 100000 net profit project 3 comes out to be 50000 net profit for project 4 comes out to be 75000 so if i only look at the figures of the net profit what do i see i see the highest figure against project 2 it seems that project 2 is the best option project 1 and project 3 looks like they are similar they have got same net profit and project 4 is second highest 75000 do you agree with this assessment of net profit that project 2 is the best project no sir and what are your reasons for that sir uh, in my opinion project 4 is uh, it has more you know net profit because its percentage of investment is lesser okay as compared you know and in the project to the percentage is investment is higher mm. then i get the net profit but as compared see, to i get this. but you see the net profit is calculated in front of you the uh, maximum net profit you get is from project two not from project four so as far as net profit is concerned Project 2 is the best project, but the method of net profit is flawed. The net profit method itself is flawed because the investment we are putting in project 2 is 10 times more than project 1 and 3. Exactly. The, uh, the money, uh, the net profit I'm getting out of project 1 and 3 is only half as good as project 2 i think it's it's a it, it is a tenth percent i would say and uh, it, it, I, the investment I, I, is in the profit is is you know 
fifty percent of as compared to the project two. Yeah, this is uh, yes exactly. So this is two less. Uh, so therefore, what is the problem in net profit? Net profit does not consider the amount of investment. It just looks at the final figure, which is not good. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I got. I got your point. Means net profit only shows the final figure. It does not, um, you know, mention not how exactly. percentage was invested. Uh, uh, what, uh, it does not. Yeah. It does not take into account the amount of investment. I not. Don't talk mm -hmm. about percentage as well. No. Uh, we talk about okay. percentage later. Second thing. Okay. Second thing. Project one and project three seems like they are equal as far as the net profit is concerned. Uh, investment also is same, but the pattern of retrieval of money in project one is different from the pattern of retrieval of money in project three. Project three gives me a consistent income of thirty thousand every year, whereas Project one is just giving me ten thousand income every year for first three years. Then it doubles, and then suddenly it is hundred thousand. So the initial income for project one is very very less, and in the later year it is very high. But I can clearly see that there is a difference between project one and three. On one of them should be the better than other, but net profit method is not able to recognize that. It's not able to understand which project is better. It is just giving me a final figure. Are you with me? Yes, sir. So net profit, as such, uh, though in some of the books it is considered as one of the cash flow methods. But as it is shown in business analysis book, it is not shown as a method at all. This is not shown as a method at all. And the other four okay. methods have been indicated there. So these are the different five methods. Net profit is the uh, the basic method, and it is not a very good method, as I I just said. And many people do not even consider this method to be used. But yes, this is very much a method. The next method is payback period. Payback period is which project pays my investment back the earliest. If I have invested hundred thousand rupees, how soon can I retrieve those hundred thousand rupees? So whichever project retrieves the invested sum the earliest is the best project. This is the definition of payback period. Are you with me? Yes, sir. Means in in which on which time we can get the you know revenue payback what oh, we have payback. invested. Exactly. Right? exactly. I am just you know introducing these uh, these things to you. Payback mm -hmm. is that. Now return on investment is something which actually I guess you were trying to mention when you said percentage. So rate return on investment is about the percentage thing. You know. In 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 very simple terms, uh, this is the average annual profit. Average annual profit. This is uh, if converted into percentage against the investment. Average annual profit, if converted into a percentage as comparison in comparison with the total investment. Is called return on investment. For example, in the in this case, project one, the investment was hundred thousand, and the net profit was fifty thousand, meaning the total benefit, total profit you have received in five years is fifty thousand, and if I divide this fifty thousand in five years, it comes out to be on average. Ten thousand per year, then our average annual profit is ten thousand. Investment is hundred thousand. What is ten thousand 
to 100,000. This is exactly 10% of the total investment. So my return on investment is 10%. You got me? Yes, sir. 10%, but it, we consider the period as well, isn't it? No, we, uh, yes, period, of course, but we have, uh, we have divided that net profit by the period. Hmm. 50,000 divided by 5. Yeah, because there's a period as well, maybe one year, two year. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying average annual profit percentage. Yeah. So why isn't, um, okay, it is, we, we calculate on the, the year basis, annual, is, why it is not on the per month basis? Annual right. means per year, I mean per month, uh, per month and year, when we calculate using the annual, we consider per month in a year. So we calculate means, for example, in this example, if I say 10,000 per year, then 10,000. What is the average um, per annual average? What is the per annual average? So means uh, 10,000 will be divided in by 12. No, get the, you know, no, every no. Year. no. Okay. I say average annual, average annual okay. profit. So the total profit in five years averaged out for one year understand mm -hmm. yes. Total profit for so many years averaged for one year is average annual profit is not about months it's about the number of years divided by uh, it's about a uh, total benefit divided by the total number of years okay <clears throat> so return on investment is a better method than net profit because return on investment does take into account the investment and therefore it, th there is some sanity in it though it is a very famous method you might have heard ROI you know in, in presentations you might have heard the ROI of this project is very high so ROI mm -hmm. is good but from my perspective ROI is not a standard this is not that good uh, estimate I'll show you Next is next net okay. present value. Net present value means what is the value of money? What is the value of money related to time? A hundred rupee note hundred years ago is not equal to hundred rupees note today. Do you agree with me? Mm -hmm. Therefore, yes. what we have done so far in net profit, in payback, in ROI, we have, we have considered that money is money and it doesn't change value, which is a wrong assumption. Money which is going to be coming to me after five years is not equal to today's money. Therefore, net present value takes into account the time and the value of money increasing or decreasing according to time. Got it? Yes, sir. So, just like we got the net profit, we calculate the net present value, and that is more sane method of calculating uh, uh, which which project is the best. Then last but not the least is the internal rate of return, which we call IRR. IRR is a further refinement on NPV, but until and unless you understand what the NPV is, you will not be able to understand IRR. Therefore, I will like to move ahead and show you each one of these methods. First, again, uh, let me explain net profit to you the four projects right in front of you same figure and these the red highlighted area is your net profit now look at the next slide here I am showing that project 2 which seems like a great project giving us the maximum figure is not so great because it has a very high investment 
Project 1 and Project 3, which looks like equal to each other in investment as well as in net profit, actually differ a lot in the pattern of receiving the revenues, which is not catered in this method. So net profit is not a good method conclusively. Next comes the payback period. Again, a comparatively much simpler method. For example, in project one, we invested 100,000 rupees. When are we get, getting back these 100,000? How much time we require to get this money back? After one year, I have 10,000. After one year, I have another 10,000, so 20,000. After three years, I have another 10 years, meaning 30 years, uh, 30,000. After four years, I just have 50,000, half the money I have got. Remaining half will take another half year, right? So you see that project one will retrieve my money in almost four and a half years. What about project two? Investment is hundred uh, one million. So when is this 1 million completed? For the first 4 years, I just receive 800,000. Eight, uh, meaning that I need to have, uh, uh, I have to go into 5th year. 5th year, it gives me 3,000. Meaning what? That almost 4.67 years are required. 4.67 years is my payback period. Look at project number three, 100,000. In three years, we have retrieved 90,000 rupees, a little more, a little uh, time <coughs> from the fourth year and we <coughs> have paid back. Meaning it requires 3.33 years to pay back. Project four, Investment is 120,000. It exactly requires four years to pay you back. So, looking at this situation, which is the best project? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can you repeat that? Your question, I can't hear you before. I am saying out of the four projects in front of you, which mm -hmm. is, uh, has which has the minimum payback period. Minimum payback period is uh, of course project three because it's three point uh, three three one or two. Can, uh, three point three three. So yeah, three point three. The project three proves to be the best uh, as far as the payback period is concerned, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that means that project two has been proven to be not feasible project one and three which we were unable to differentiate actually project two three is better than project one and even project four so project three proves to be the best as far as the payback period is concerned now when should you be using this method Make your guess. When should you be using this method in your project? When we should use this method? Why do you require the payback period? Why your investment you have invested in the project do you want it back soon? Because I want my investment uh, uh, back soon, yeah. Recover, yes. But why? Why do you want it soon? Uh, to maybe for, to invest more. Mm -hmm. So or, I'm um, I am trying sorry? the fi five wise on you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> You see what happens is, what happens is, if I have taken loan for this project, 
-hmm. I have to pay back the bank. If I pay back later, I have to pay back more. Therefore, I would wish that my project should be able to pay back as early as possible as if I, I don't have to pay much to the bank. And then I own the business or the project. Isn't right? that increasing my cost as well? Increasing what? My cost as well if the period is long. Yes, of course it is. Of course it is. But naturally, if I do not have to recover the money soon, I am not worried about recovering the money soon, then uh, maybe I can look for long term benefits. But if I have to pay back the loan, then uh, it is not important for me whether this project is good in long term or not. I just want it to be giving me as much money as soon as possible as if I can pay back the loan and then I own the business. Hmm. Right. So this is the only situation where payback period is used. But this is naturally a very important factor why we should be using this method. Got it? Yes, sir. Got it. Now coming over to the return on investment method, as I said, return on investment method is a good method, but it's not that good. Return on investment, uh, very simple. We will have to find the average annual profit. In case of project one, 50,000 divided by five is my 5,000 is my average annual profit. Sorry, uh, 10,000 is my average annual profit divided by the total investment. That is 100,000. So that comes out to be 0.1 multiplied by 100 that is converted into percentage that gives me 10%. So the formula is average annual profit divided by total investment into 100 gives me the return on investment. Got it? Okay. So we see. Yes, sir. I right. So we see that. Out of the four projects, first project gives me an ROI of uh, 10%, project 2, 2%, project 3, 10%, and project 4 gives me 12.5%. So the best is project 4. You see mm. how your opinion is changing. Every time you are doing analysis, your opinion is changing, and not only changing, it is being refined. So now I know that project four seems good from ROI point of view. I also know and understand that project two is the worst project, which is giving me only 2% ROI. And there is one confusion still that is project one and project three. Again, the ROI is same. That profit is same. Investment is same. So the, the, this method of ROI has some flaw. It cannot differentiate between project one and project three. Although the payback period did tell us that project three from the payback point of view was a better option, but ROI cannot differentiate between project one and project three as far as the R ROI is concerned. So you see, this is also a flawed method. Though it is better than net profit, but it is still not the best method. Got it? But why it why it is misleading? It is not misleading. You have taken the average annual profit, right? Did you consider anywhere the value of money? You know, ten thousand, ten thousand, ten thousand. You just kept adding all the amounts, which comes out to be one fifty. You took the net profit 50,000. You divided it simply without considering when the money is coming early or late. You just took the whole sum of the money and divided it by five years, averaged it out to each year. And then you calculated a percentage. So therefore, the element of when the money is coming is not included in it, which leaves it as bad as the net profit method. Um, when the money and I think uh, the present value of money because in five years, yes, you know, 
we do not, not we do not consider the payment value in return of investment return on uh, on investment roi yes does not consider the present value hmm so the next method would 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 do that and next method is npv so far the npv is supposed to be the best method so what does npv do okay before you can understand npv i would like to understand uh, do you know what a compound interest is so what a compound interest what, if, what is a compound interest oh, yes sir i i know some what i mean compound interest yeah okay is there is a formula of calculating it okay okay let's see let's see let's see let's see uh, there is a bank which offers you a 10% interest rate you put a 100000 rupees into that bank how much money will it, will it give you after one year uh with 10% of interest yes it will give us, uh, it will give 110 110 100 hmm. okay how much money will you get after 2 years 120 if if the percentage is same percentage is same yeah, are you 120 sure? are you sure it is 120 Mm, I think it will be lesser than 120. Okay, let me explain. You have put 100,000 rupees in the bank. Mm -hmm. After one year, they added 10,000 to your account. Mm -hmm. Right? After yes. another one year, the uh, the basic amount of hundred thousand that due to that you get another ten percent right so that will be calculated on 110 actually mm. right exactly so what about the ten thousand you got last year you have to do the ten percent of that also because in second year that will also give you the profit so the profit ten mm -hmm. percent profit out of ten thousand would be how much it will be 11000 right 1000 10000 uh, will 10000 will give the uh, so how much thousand in you have originally 1 lakh rupees then 10000 of the second year uh, first year mm -hmm. and then 10000 of the uh, 10000 and 1000 yeah it comes out exactly this is 121 so the interest you received was on 110 not on uh, not on 100 yeah, you yeah I forgot that. yeah, yeah. in the third year you the interest you will get would be based on 121 yes this is called compound interest right yeah. <clears throat> so the formula for that would be that you know you are to, uh, investing today and you are trying to estimate the value in future so future value let me write it down here the future value is equal to present value multiplied by 1 plus interest rate raised to the power number of years. Right? So what is the interest rate? The amount is 100,000 and interest rate is 1 plus say 10%. 10, 10 and how many years are you looking at say one year so if it is one year then 
it would come out to be 100,000 multiplied by 1 plus 10 divided by 100. Is it okay? So can you say mm -hmm. 1 plus 0 0.1? And can you say 1.1 raised to the power 1? Which is equal mm -hmm. to? which is equal to 100,000 multiplied by 1.1 because anything raised to yes. the power 1 is the same, 1.1. Yes. So this comes out to be 1,10,000 uh, uh, 1, rupees. But what if the value mm -hmm. was 2? If this was 2, if this was 2, then it would be 1.21. And the answer would have been 121,000. Similarly, mm -hmm. you can have five years, five years, five years. And this, uh, sorry, this value would have been different. You got me? Yes, sir. So this is a simple formula. So if you consider this formula, then probably I can uh, reverse this formula. Okay, first of all, you understand. If I'm investing into into the future, I am putting my money into the bank and I am investing for the future, the future value I can calculate. But the future value is not so far, it is not here with me. I can calculate the future value, but I, uh, I just have the present value right now. I have the 100,000 rupees with me, which I'm investing. But I am calculating that it will give me this much money. The future value of the money is higher than the present value. <clears throat> so this is as far as the interest rate is concerned. In projects, what we are doing, we are in cost benefit analysis, what we are doing, we are doing all of this in reverse. What we are trying to do is we are trying to ascertain the present value of how the how our business is going to behave in future so we create some cash flows that this much money will come after one year this much money will come after two years and then you must be able to calculate the present value for each amount for first year the present value of the first year the present value of the second year the present value of the third year and ultimately you can sum it up just like we did net profit. But this time when the present values will be added, that would give me the net present value. Net present value. So. Okay. So. Now what I am interested in the present value present value will be future value divided by 1 plus r raised to the power t. The formula is exactly the same, except for the fact that this 1 plus thing was multiplied by pv and now it is divided by fv. So it has come here. I hope there is no problem with that. Yeah, are, you, are you okay with it? Uh, yes, sir. But one thing you must ask, why I have not used the term I for interest rate? Why do I say R? Yes, why it is R? R is a rate where uh, uh, NT oh. is already there. I, I think maybe. I don't know. R is the rate. R is the discount rate. You see, mm -hmm. when, when I am moving forward, when I'm moving forward in, into the future, it will be interested. It will be, I'll get the interest out of it. But when mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going in reverse, this is not interest. When I'm going on reverse, it is not interest, but my value is going to reduce. And it will be reduced at a percentage, which is called discount rate, discount rate. So R is the discount rate. Got it? Yes, sir. Okay. So 
the interesting game is that who issues this fixes these interest rates and the discount rates actually this is the national bank like the state bank of pakistan or whatever uh, the central bank of that country is they set the interest and discount rates every year and they are not equal interest rate is not equal to the discount rate for example you invest in your bank and bank gives you a profit right the based on the interest interest rate the interest rate which the bank is paying say let us assume that they are paying you 10% why are they they paying you 10% why are they so kind that whatever they are earning they are giving it to you do you have you ever thought about it why are the banks paying us the interest because they are making their money as well exactly. on my on, on, my, on my money that is the game actually they are making the money and out of the money they make they just give some of it to me that means they are making more money how much more this you will only understand if you are a businessman bank is paying you say 10 10% 10% is a very high figure you know banks do not pay nowadays uh, that much amount they are just 2 to 6% this is the rate nowadays worldwide in uh, um, in uh, developed countries it is like half percent or 1% in pakistan i remember in olden days it was 10 to 12% because it was a developing country as we the time is passing and we are modernizing our interest rates are going down so right now it is like 6% or something 5 or 6% i remember in 90 1990 when i went to usa those days pakistan was 12% and american banks were paying 5 or 6% nowadays mm. pakistan is paying 5 or 6% and american banks are paying 0.5 and 1% mm-hmm. anyways that is another story but if this this is the formula for calculating our planned uh, present value then can i write it like that future value multiplied by 1 divided by 1 plus r raised to the power t are you fine with it mm-hmm. okay let us separate this portion 1 divided by 1 plus r raised to the power t and let's call it, call it discount factor so that was uh, r was discount rate r was discount rate and this whole formula this much portion is discount factor and if you look at it closely this portion closely you will find that there is nothing in this there are only two unknowns r and t discount rate and time and if there are only two variables then it is not a very difficult formula we can always resolve it for example i say if the value of r is 10% and number of years is 1 what will be this discount factor can you calculate that you just replace the value of r and t and you will find the discount rate sorry discount mm-hmm. factor so there will be a mm-hmm. value you get if you have that value you can simply multiply that value with future value and you will get the present value i have a question here why we are having a the discount in calculating the present value and for future value why do we have a interest rate okay. although both you know okay i am sitting today investing investing my money in a bank right mm-hmm. i am trying to look into the future and calculate into the future what will i get tomorrow 
or after five years this is i am calculating the future value of my money right mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. now let's come back to the scenario of feasibility study where we were doing a business or we were trying to assess uh, how my business will run i assume i think that i will get 10000 rupees after one year but the question mm -hmm. is the money i am investing today into this business uh, 100000 uh, is the 10000 rupees which i will get after one uh, one year equal to today's 10000 rupees you no sir that means I am actually getting less than 10,000 rupees. So the present mm -hmm. value of that future value is less than 10,000. That is 9,000 something, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, mm -hmm. the another 10,000 which I'll get after two years, what is the present value of those? I find that it is like something, 8,000 something. So the money which I get late into the future is is less today therefore the net profit thing is not good because that profit was not considering the future value of the money it was considering the face value of the money now okay. if you can somehow calculate the future value of the of the money i can then sum up and find the net present value of my project the total net worth in present value terms in the terms of aaj ka paisa today's money so that will actually change the whole situation got it yes sir okay the discount means i get the lesser lesser less amount exactly and interest is i get the um high amount ji bilkul you will get less Sorry, sir. Yes, you will get less money today. You, if you calculate that money, you will get less. Okay. Now, now let me show you this. The present value. This is the formula I wrote. Remember, present value is mm -hmm. value in the year T. Say after five years, I will get hundred thousand rupees. So hundred thousand after five years divided by one plus. 1.1 raised to the power 5 1 to 1 raised to the power 5 right so this will give me the present value if you can put these values in this formula you will get the answer. you will get the answer but but i am telling you another easier method to calculate your present value because every time for every value you have to apply to this formula so why not draw a kind of a chart or a table of NPV, you can see table of NPV discount factors. You can draw your own, or you can find this table in any of the accounting or statistics books. Normally, this NPV discount factor table is given there. This is standard. Okay, let us see. We, you agree? What I I told you, what a discount factor is? Discount factor is one divided by one plus R raised to the power T. Okay, let us see. Say I put years on one end and the discount rates in percentage on the other. So this makes a matrix. I put one in the in this formula in the place of T here in the place of T and for the value of R, say I put five. So uh, if I put 5% here, it will be 1.05, 1.05 and the year and the time was one year, one divided by 1.05 would give me 0.9524. See, keep calculating it for different years and different percentages and you will fill in this whole, map, whole table. So this table can then be referred back to get the discount factor figure 
and simply multiply that simply multiply that with your future value just simply multiplying this discount factor the relevant discount factor with the future value of money will give me the present value of money it would be like present value is equal to future value multiplied by discount rate you got it multiplied by discount rate so discount rates are here so let us let us take the example what if uh, you have got uh, taking the same example of 10 percent and 100,000 rupees investment, um, uh, say I have 100,000 rupees coming after five years, 100 at the rate of 10%, right? So what will be the value of 100,000 rupees today? The 100,000 rupees I'm going to get is after five years. What is the value of that money today? Sir, uh, we will apply the formula. Yes, we'll find the present value. But you use this discount table. Use this mm -hmm. discount table and tell me which value. Look at what it, is the discount rate? What is the percentage? Discount percentage is ten percent. Okay, look under ten percent and look uh, next to five years. This is five, yeah, years. five years. Just keep watching mm -hmm. here. The value is 6.6209. 6, yes. Multiply this value by 100,000. What do you get? Multiply by 100,000. That will give you 62,090 rupees. That will be the present value. That is the right. present value. So um, money uh, which is 100,000 which is you are going to get after 5 years, it is worth 62,090 rupees. For example, you have, you promised to pay me 100,000 after 5 years, okay? And for mm -hmm. getting those 100,000, I have to wait for 5 years and then you will give me that money, right? Mm -hmm. So what I am telling you is, please give me some money now i i will not claim 100000 rupees after 5 years but i need money now so what is the present value of money you will pay me you will pay me 62090 rupees okay because i have already applied the discounting factor right exactly discount factor uh, will be applied definitely discount rate will be applied so whatever is the discount rate percentage according to that I will look at this table, I'll calculate the formula, whatever, uh, there are two separate methods. I, I can do it both ways. Same value I'll get both ways. So okay. that will give you the worth of that money today. Now let's okay. apply this, uh, this thing on your uh, first project. Okay, uh, a trick question you have invested in project one a sum of hundred thousand rupees that discount rate is ten percent what will be the value of the future value sorry, sorry the present value what will be the present value of hundred thousand rupees it's sixty two thousand uh, something right Listen to the question again. I have invested 100,000 rupees today. Mm -hmm. The rate of discount is 10%. Yes. What will be the future value of this money? Sorry, future money. What will be the present value of this money? Yes. present value of 100,000 when you apply then it will be you know 9,000 something um, how right. many years are you calculating on no I'm just uh, uh, because discount rate is applied on 10 10 percent on 100,000 right okay. then it will uh, it will give me lesser amount something okay 
I agree with you uh, as far as that thing is concerned. So let me write it down here. You say that you will say a just a moment. Uh, present value is equal to a uh, hundred thousand divided by one plus uh, one point one, right? Raised to the yes, power what? Raised to the power what? What yes, is the raised time? to the power. Raised to the power? One, because I'm calculating for first year, I mean current year. Who told you the value is one? Because I'm calculating the present value. Yeah, but who told you the value is one? One year has not passed. Look at look okay. at this. How, when are you investing the money? It's a zero you, year. Means exactly. That is my point. Zero years. So mm -hmm. anything raised to the power zero is? One. One. So this whole of this thing cancels out. It is one. So okay. the 10,000 I'm investing today is 10,000 rupees. Sorry, 100,000 rupees I'm investing today is 100,000 rupees because that is lying in my pocket. That is with me. Mm -hmm. I know it is 100,000 rupees. It is 100,000 rupees today. So it, today it is 100,000 rupees. <laughs> Year zero, it is 100,000 rupees. Okay. And then we are I'm investing. So this value is negative. So the present value of my investment is equal to the same value, which is minus 10,000. Got it? Okay, we are saying that we did not get any discount. That's why we are showing in oh, minus. Cannot be applied, it's the same. Huh? Discount rate cannot okay. be applied because the, you are trying to find the present value of present value. You understand my point? Yes. Yeah. Present value yes. of present value. There is no future value. You are investing money today mm -hmm. and you are trying to find the present value of this money today. The present value of present mm -hmm. value, value is same. Okay, but got you. But the money, uh, uh, 10,000 rupees, which is coming after one year. So in this case, uh, my value, sorry. In this case, uh, the raise to the power time, period, time value will be one. That means I have to divide how many? 10,000 rupees. Now, in this case, these are just 10,000 rupees. This is plus 10,000 rupees. Here we have got 1. So 1.1 days to power 1 is 1.1. 10,000 divided by 1.1 is equal to 9.90. Oh, sorry, 0 0.9091. Okay. So 10,000 multiplied by 9091. 0 0.9091 is 9,091 rupees. So this is for the first year. The 10,000 rupees I'm going to get after one year is today equal to 9091 that 10,000 mm -hmm. rupees I'm going to get after two years is equal to 0 0.8264 meaning 8,264 rupees and the 10,000 rupees I'm going to get after three years is equal to 7,513 rupees and similarly the 20,000 I'm going to get after four years is today equal to 13,660 rupees. Hmm. And the 100,000 rupees I'm going to get after five years is today worth 62,090 rupees. And if you sum it all up, like just like net profit you calculated, the net present value is summing up all the negative and positive values in which the investment will also be added, summed up as a negative value. So, we are in profit. We are getting 618, 618 which is more than plus, it's very low. more than zero. It is very low. That is a point. So how do you compare the net profit with NPV? You know, net profit is the same project is 50,000, whereas the mm -hmm. discount rate is very low. Although this is feasible, but if I had option of another project which has a better NPV, I would have gone for that. And this also shows mm -hmm. 
that there is a likelihood that some of the calculations for some of the project that this value could even come out to be zero or it could even be going into negative but for project one this is 618 okay let us apply it to other projects this is a summary of all the projects look at uh, this side the discount rate side uh, this uh, calculation on the left hand is the same which is for the net profit but the place where it is written discount rate uh, at 10 percent so i have calculated this discount rate for project one two three four just look at project one six six hundred something project two the npv is how much our project two and npv is minus one lakh seventy nine thousand and seven fifty rupees such mm -hmm. a low value such a low value so this makes project two completely unfeasible this mm -hmm. makes it invisible at all and now just look at the difference between project one and project three project one is 620 and project three is 13700 although the investment is equal the net profit is equal the roi is equal but only difference between project one and three is depicted either through a payback period or through a npv so npv shows that project three is much better than project one but the story doesn't stop here we have yet to look at the project four project four gives us an npv of 21,665 rupees so probably this is the best option project four is the best project as far as npv is concerned and npv is a fantastic method of calculation out of the method we have studied so far npv is the best method but we are still left with one method and that method is called internal rate of return okay okay now just listen to me uh, what is internal rate of return do you understand when i said in npv that the value of npv could have been zero or even negative but you do understand that positive is a good value and negative is a bad value and what is zero zero is a what is zero zero is an e current year means present year no 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 you are totally lost I am saying about NPV. If the NPV is more than more than zero, is a positive value, it is good. It's a positive profit. Yes, and if NPV is less than uh, is negative value, then it is bad. Yes. But if NPV is equal to exactly equal to zero, then no profit, no loss. Right. Such a point is called. What do you call it? break even point uh, break even break point. even, break even okay, point break. that we have broken even whatever we have invested that much we have got back this is the break even point zero zero point okay anything break more even. than that is profit right so mm -hmm. okay uh, just remember this thing and let me explain another thing npv is a very good method but for npv we had taken the value of R, the discount rate, from where? Discount rate and interest rate, these two values, in calculating NPV PV and present value or future value, we take it from the national bank. And national bank issues these rates to all the banks of Pakistan. 
I mean the State Bank of Pakistan issues these rates to all, all banks of Pakistan and they are bound to follow it. If I calculate my project which has absolutely nothing to do with a bank, bank is a di different business, my business is a different business. But still, I just want to see the money I am in, investing in this initiative, should I invest it in this, uh, in this project or should I keep that money in the bank? Because if bank is giving me more profit, then probably I should not be investing in a project. Project has to be feasible. Project has to break even. Only then I will invest in the project. Otherwise, it is better to put the money in bank. That is why I am relying on the banks, on the bank's value. The NPV is actually making me capable of finding the bank's value and comparing against the bank's value. But if you are look, thinking as a true businessman, it will be stupid for a businessman to compare a business with a bank. Because bank is no business at all. Bank invests invest its money into businesses and makes a lot of money. And if you are starting a business or a project, then you are going to make much more money than the banks do. But you do not understand at this stage how much better your business or your project is as compared to the bank. So stop comparing yourself to the bank because you are not a bank. Try to find the internal strength of your project. What is the internal rate of return? Internally, what your project is capable of giving back? Rate of return. It is not at all dependent on the bank rate. Therefore, there is no value of discount rate possible. This is not, not applicable. So the discount rate we are not going to get from the banks anymore. In IRR, we are just trying to find the break-even point. Although NPV is a very good method, but without using the discount rate, can I find the, the uh, uh, break-even point? What is your opinion? I think I don't think so. We can find uh, the break-even point because how we calculate when we will know what is the profit. You know, there must be some criteria to know what okay. is. Uh, if I am not using the discount rate, I am not saying uh, that we can't use any rate. I am not using the bank rate. I am not dependent on state bank of Pakistan, but. The value for project one you see was very low, 618, right? At 10 percent, at 10 percent, it was 618. But if I do some hit and trial and try to reduce the value of 10 percent to 9 percent, do mm -hmm. I get a better result? So my value will change naturally if I change the percentage, 618 mm -hmm. will either increase or decrease. Right? Yes, it will be the numbers. So I am trying to find the break even point. So let us vary the percentage. Let's make one calculation on 10%, one on 9%, one on 8%, 7%, 6%, 4%. And I am trying to find where it becomes exactly equal to zero. Where my okay. NPV, total NPV of the project becomes exactly equal to zero. If I can know that point, that is the internal rate of return of my project. That is the internal rate of return of my project. Therefore, for every project, I have to do this. And for every project, there will be a different percentage I will find as a break even point. Means we will apply different percentage, discount percentage every year. This is what you are no, saying. Not every year, not every year. For every project. The project, okay. Not every year. If for one project, the discount rate will remain static. If you have selected 7% okay. 
and you found that 7% makes the energy is equal to zero, then it is 7% for that project. For another project, say project two, it could be 9%. For project three, it could be 12%. So I am not interested in finding the value of NPV because NPV, I say that I want to see it zero. Make the NPV zero and try to find that percentage on which it becomes exactly zero. That percentage is my internal rate of return. And the highest internal rate of return is the best. So which project is going to give me the highest internal rate of return? I will select that project. Okay. So this is all about the different methods of cost benefit analysis. Let me close this presentation down. I hope I made the points point very clear to you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I think today we should finish this uh, need assessment. We have just one odd topic left in it. Mm -hmm. So you can read these definitions. Yes, sir, I can see. And uh, I think uh, in the level of detail which I have taught you, uh, these definitions are uh, nothing near to it. OK. Let's uh, move on to 2.6, that is assemble the business case. Now that you have all the ingredients, you have done all, all everything, you have done the analysis, you have done the, you know, all the calculations now assemble the business case not all business problems and opportunities require a formal business case uh, this uh, we were talking yesterday also executives in an organization may approve projects and programs based on competitive pressure government mandate or executive inclination in those cases a project charter to initiate program or project is sufficient uh, these are the things you have to uh, add into your business case what is the problem and the opportunity what is the analysis of the situation? Naturally, you have you have done the analysis. You, we have taught about, taught you all about that. How to identify the problem and then write that problem here. Write your whole analysis of the situation here. Then your recommendations here. Your evaluation here. This is all what the business case is made up of. Last but not the least, the value of the business case. When a business case is created, it becomes a valued input to the project initiation meaning if the business case is ready then the project will be done and project will be initiated and the basic input going into the initiation of the project is the business case so it is a valued input to the project initiation providing the project team with a concise and comprehensive view of the business needs and the approved solutions to that need more it is more than a simple input it is just not an input this is a major input. A business case is a living document that is constantly referenced throughout a project or a program. It may be necessary to review and update a business case based on what is discovered as a program or a project progresses over time. Maybe the business case changes because the business case is tied to the organizational strategy and the business need. So what if the organization changes its strategy or the business need is changed. So the business case will have to be revised, no matter if the project and program is now running. Even then, if the business case changes, we have to change the way the project or the program is running, or maybe sometimes we have to close it down. That project may not be important anymore. When a business case is inadequate or non-consistent, the product scope may be unclear or poorly defined. So business case, <clears throat> more clearer the business case is, the better product scope will be defined. This in turn often leads to scope creep. Scope creep meaning anything, uh, the scope of the project is changing without due permission or proper change request procedure. So 
unknowingly you are constantly making changes to the scope without a formal process that is called scope creep and if you do that naturally you have to work more and naturally there is no money for that work so you will run out of the cost and project will also be delayed a business case can help to address the possible risks of having to cancel a project due to loss of sponsor or stakeholder support costs exceeding the perceived benefit and changes to the business naturally we are doing catering for that in the revision of the business case and therefore projects will not suffer possibly worse than terminating a project is finishing a project only to have the end product not to be used because the solution did not match the business needs <coughs> you have successfully completed a project but the product of the project is not workable no i i give uh, an example very uh, very often that you have constructed a school on funding from maybe some international body and you are very happy the project is successful but that school it never goes into operation you never you know hire staff for that school you never organize that school you never uh, enroll students for that school so what is the fun of making the school so this project is useless it is better that this was cancelled earlier at the stage of the business case rather than constructing the whole thing and then uh, it proves to be useless so the collaboration point here is the business analyst work closely with a sponsor to create a business case when the project manager is known the business analyst consults with the project manager as you know project manager comes a bit late but sometimes the person who is going to be the project manager is known so business analyst may consult with him if the project manager exists to achieve a stronger business case through close collaboration project manager may better understand the business need feasibility risks and other major facet of the business case because project manager should have that understanding to validate whether he should be going on with this project or not so business case is a very important document for project manager to gain understanding of the project the reasons why this was this was initiated when a project or program is approved the business analyst and project manager may work together during initiation to ensure the business case is properly translated into project charter and are similar documents so that's about all that sums up the need assessment need assessment has taken our uh, complete three lectures six hours we have spent on need assessment and i was expecting we could have done it earlier but it is good that we have thoroughly gone through it so from today from tomorrow uh, uh, we will be uh, starting planning that is the next domain so your next domain would be planning so any questions uh sir um uh if you can send me this document where we discuss the example and uh, the rest of the documents are in over here in the document section right okay but i have not sent you the link for uh, uh one drive i hope i send that no sir i have not received any oh. link of the lectures i am sorry i am sorry i'll 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 do that actually and i have the documents to... are here in the here yeah uh, documents are the here documents are in the... can you download sorry? it are you able to download them and use them yes sir in the material sections right so um, i will okay. i'll send you and can you send me this one example uh, yeah i'll send you a link for the whole thing yeah and this in, in the example we discussed today i i'll add that to, to... i add that and i'll send you okay sir and if you could send me the links of uh, you know uh, links of link of uh, the lectures uh recorded lectures yes sir 
I have not yet not uploaded it. It's a very slow process. It takes about four to six hours. I have all all the lectures. Uh, uh, I I have not edited them so far. Uh, lectures are there. Today's lecture today's lecture will also be ready in another four to six hours. And uh, mm -hmm. okay, I'll, I can I can send you the links for these. As if you can start. Yes, sir. It's okay if it's not uh, uh, if it's not edited. Uh, it doesn't make any difference because I have my questions of in the you know in the recording, so it will be beneficial for me what I of ask course. and what you replied for. Of course, of course, we will get it. So let's uh, uh, let's finish off and call it a night and let's uh, meet tomorrow again. Thank you very much for your company, and see you. Thank tomorrow. you, sir. Okay. Thank right. you so much.